Thank you so much. I'm talking about museum villages uh, for two big reasons. The first is I think they're really, really, really interesting. Um, and they're really good interpretive tools. But the second is that I think that understanding the development of these types of museums is really important to understanding St. Augustine, how it is today, and how it developed, um, starting primarily in the 1950s onward um, with the historic St. Augustine Preservation Board. And we'll get to that uh, later in the talk. But um, a large chunk of downtown St. Augustine, primarily on the, uh, the north end of St. George Street near the city gate, was a museum village at one point in time. So um, we will get there. But um, I will go ahead and start off with this little quote by Dwight Pickathley. Dr. Dwight Pickathley, he was the chief historian for the National Park Service for 10 years. Started doing some research about this topic and I was uh, reaching out to some other um, historians who are related, who've done work with reconstructions. Um, I started out looking at reconstructions specifically. And I reached out to Dwight Pickathley and he said, you know, I, um, I was writing a book about that, and I uh, dumped all my research up in um, West Virginia, Harper's Ferry at the Design Center up there. So I was like, oh, great. So I originally planned on talking to you guys about reconstructions and the issues with reconstructions in, um, in the historic preservation movement, but I kind of latched on to this idea of um, museum villages, and it's kind of developed to this point. So um, I hope it will make sense, but um, I, th I think it might. But uh, I really enjoyed this quote by, by Dwight. In recent years, the American public has become increasingly enamored of its past without actually understanding either the nature of history or of historical processes. And he talks, he goes on a little bit about in that piece about um, an epidemic case of nostalgia and hero worship and what have you. But um, so that's gonna, that's gonna, that's a good lead into what we're gonna start talking about. But what is a museum village? And I think, um, I do wanna say up front, I love museum villages. So uh, I mention that because we're gonna be dipping into the realm of cynicism uh, frequently. So um, I just wanted to come out front and say mm -hmm. I really love museum villages. I go to them any chance I get when I'm in a town. But uh, back to what museum villages are. I think the best example you're probably familiar with is Colonial Williamsburg. I think everyone kind of, you know, everyone nods their heads like, oh yeah, 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 I know what you're talking about now. But, um, and we'll talk more about Colonial Williamsburg specifically later. But, um, but I think you know, everyone knows what Colonial Williamsburg is. So the idea of a museum village is that you're traversing a three-dimensional space that usually attempts to recreate uh, a past environment. Um, it's intended to be more immersive than a typical museum exhibit. So you might kind of be under understand like a transitive type development. You know, we went from like a static exhibit in a museum to the period room in a museum um, to the house museum and then on to the museum village. So um, in some cases, museum villages are multiple house museums that are strung together, but it's not always the case. But um, what you do get is not only the contents of the houses, but the houses themselves and the architecture is on display and the, um, the craftsmanship that went into building those structures. So by walking the site, you are also being introduced to the space that is in a way a little bit unfamiliar to us today and I will invoke Herschel Shepard, who I don't believe is here, but um, he talked earlier in the series. Um, uh, I think he was the first, he kicked off the lecture series this year for the Historical Society. But Herschel always talks about when you're downtown St. Augustine that, that, and why the scale of the buildings is so important is that it's a human scaled building. When you go into a big city, if you go to Jacksonville, if you go to uh, New York City, blah, 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 the buildings are built on an entirely different scale that aren't relatable to our human proportions. So one of the, you know, because they were built back uh, it, to in, in a more relatable way to human scale, historically, you're kind of getting that, um, that sense by going back into a museum village. Uh, the spaces are also typically involving very robust craft programs. You see people demonstrating um, crafts that were necessary to the survival of the community in days gone by. So not only is this an opportunity to um, uh, not only is this an opportunity to engage to learn about traditional crafts, but it also creates an opportunity to engage multiple senses. So instead of reading this display about what wrought iron is, you're hearing the ring of a blacksmith's hammer. You're smelling uh, coal coming from the forge, and it's a really um, participatory, active experience rather than a passive experience. <clears throat> 
I was supposed to click through some of these slides, I think. Oh, that was the one. Um, ringing of a blacksmith's hammer, you're smelling the coal. There's three types of museum villages, I think, to kind of establish uh, this as we go forward. There is the restored village, the recreated village, and the reconstructed village. The first one, the restored village is gonna be historic structures. They're on their original site, uh, in their original locations, original buildings, and they've been restored typically to a period of significance, um, which is you know, you, a predetermined time that you've decided that this is what we're, uh, the time period that we are going to say this house existed, exists in our interpretation. And well, I'm gonna, we'll come back to that in a second. But um, so original buildings restored to a specific time period. Recreated villages, the structures are historic. They are truly um, historic buildings, but they've often been moved from other places in the community or even somewhere else from the state or somewhere else from the country. So they've been shipped in. So the buildings are original, historic, but the, uh, the layout that they're put into, the context of them is not original, it is fictional. It's uh, the, that community that's being made with those buildings together never actually existed in history. And then the last thing we have is the reconstructed village. So the original structures aren't around anymore. Maybe they've been demolished, uh, they've fallen apart. Um, we want to experience them in the present day, so we rebuild them. So uh, most of the time we have archaeological excavations to determine where the original foundations are and the buildings can be reconstructed on those original foundations, and that is um, an interesting way to do it. Uh, it's not always how it's done. Um, in cases such as like Plymouth Plantation and stuff like that, they, they wanted to be in the general area, but not, uh, on, they're not right on top of the original uh, space. Sometimes you don't know where the original space is. Um, when buildings aren't built exactly uh, in the same spot, they might end up being more representational of what could have been here, not necessarily what really did exist in history. Uh, these are some photos from St. Augustine. Specifically, this is when they were building um, Crucial Coffee. The building that is Crucial Coffee today was a blacksmith shop in that a museum village I mentioned that uh, was in St. Augustine. So this is kind of, you know, using, uh, you can see in the back this like very, um, hand-hewn lumber, do, using traditional methods to construct this. These are giant coquina stone blocks that were brought in from Flagler County to build the Salcedo House, which is now Whetstone's Chocolates. Um, it's also where the Spanish Bakery is, right on St. George Street. So they brought in boulders of coquina, they shaped them on site, and they constructed them um, on site on the original foundations that they had located there. It's from St. Augustine. Um, I wanted to read you, I, I, as we kind of progress here in talking about this, I wanted to, um, oh, I sh also want to say that most of these also you will find when you go to these museum villages, they include an aspect of living history, which is uh, interpreters sometimes dressed in uh, um, outfits that were, uh, I don't want to say costume, I know people bristle at that, but um, period outfits. Um, to kind of create more of that immersive experience in the guides sometimes, uh, depending on how particular they want to be, they can be, um, uh, you know, very much in character and pretend that they are living in that time period, or they can be, um, they can break the fourth wall a little bit and be describing what they're doing uh, as, a, as a modern person, just in period uh, clothing. Um, these, we're going to go through just, these are some first sentences from guidebooks, descriptive sentences from the guidebooks uh, that I was kind of looking at about, they were, these are mostly published in the 60s and some of them in the early 70s, but about uh, guidebooks to museum villages. There were a lot of them, there were, are, there are many, there were many more um, in the last couple of decades and um, I thought, this, this, to me this is very illustrative of how they were meant to be perceived. So this, um, this first one is a, uh, from a book called America's Historic Village and Rest Villages and Restorations by a gentleman named Irvin Haas. America's Historic Villages, Real and in Replica, are three-dimensional essays in living history that enable the visitor to recreate the past by walking down time-worn streets and entering ancient buildings where he can fantasize the lives and activities of our ancestors as, as they existed in a particular setting. Uh, the next one, this is a by, uh, from the book Experiencing America's Past by uh, Gerald and Patricia Gutek. Uh, 
And this says, a visiting a museum village is a way of rediscovering our roots as Americans. And unlike a visit to a typical museum where the exhibits are protected in glass cases, the exploration of a historic village enables you to be a time traveler, nearly an active participant in the past. Museum Villages USA by Nicholas Zook. The description reads, the museum villages of the United States are, far, are a far-flung tapestry of American history, splendid in detail and capable of projecting you into time past. This is from the Living History Source book by Jay Anderson. The first chapter is called Into the Time Warp. And he says, historic sites and outdoor museums have often have a powerful effect, especially if they use living history, the simulation of life in another time. So um, reading these, the problematic nature of museum villages starts to kind of become illuminated. A common theme um, is time travel. And this concept that by visiting these sites, you're able to travel back in time. And the problem with this uh, is that it is, of course, is not true. And time travel is not possible. And I did, this is my one exception. I hate to call out Old Bedford Village, but because I've never been there. I don't know if anyone's been there, if you know someone who works there. But using their website was a lot like traveling back in time. And um, we, we, gotta, we need a GoFundMe for Old Bedford Village. We're going to, I'll get it, I'll start an email going for you guys afterwards. But anyway, so here's a bit of a disclaimer. I want to talk about these sites primarily as how they were established um, when they were first conceived, constructed, etc. Um, the history that was presented at that point in time. I know a lot of these sites have done a great job of updating their interpretive programs and to be, overcome a lot, of the a lot of these obstacles. But I want to look at their initial miss missions and the problems of museum villages as they developed um, in history. So this was, the, this was my analogy that I, I thought of um, when I was writing this. And I think that museum villages, we can think of them as social media for American history. And if, if you are familiar with social media, if you use social media, not, I know not everybody does, but you're getting a sense that it's, it's the... Um, the highlight reel of someone's life, correct? Not, you're not showing you, the more mu mundane things, the more boring things. We're showing like the more flashy things. And you know, as you know, we're sometimes even dolling up, dressing up our, what we do on a, uh, on a normal everyday basis and making everything seem a little bit more exciting, um, taking out the bad, highlighting the good. And this is kind of what these villages are doing to American history. And how, um, you know, how they're managing the degree of historical truth and authenticity that is presented to visitors. So we're creating, or excuse me, curating these museum, um, these images and experiences, and they don't re represent the full spectrum of experiences in a person's life. Uh, similar to how we don't do that with social media. It's not being happening at our museum villages. And it's not a bad, it's not bad. I'm not, and this is not a condemnation. This, I'm, this is not a bad thing. I'm just saying this is what's happening. And this is, um, it's, it establishes an expectation that real historical events can't live up to. So here's some of the um, things I wanted to call out, things I kind of saw as problems that um, museum villages uh, ran up against and needed to overcome as they kind of developed. Some of them still deal with these problems. Um, some of them have addressed them, some of them have not. So the first one is nostalgia. And uh, most of these sites were showing history through a very nostalgic lens. And we can look at the creation of some of these sites as reactions to things that happened, to things that were happening in America at the time. Um, some, of the, some of the sites were certainly created as cases of hero worship. And then when we look at sites dedicated to the birthplaces of presidents and founding fathers and stuff like that, we're definitely running up against that. Uh, a lot of work went into making sure that these sites are squeaky clean, unblemished stages for these sorts of individuals. And um, again, many of, uh, many of these, were, these were established as a reaction to a perceived threat on a heritage or cultural identity from outside forces. And, and we will talk a little bit about that later. Um, dangle that carrot there. But next one is conjecture. This is a good opportunity to mention a larger concept in the preservation field that comes into play here, and this is the scrape, anti-scrape debate. And um, you may be familiar with this, but essentially the scrape side, 
of the scrape anti scrape debate is that um, interested in restoring a building to a very specific time period and scraping off any additions to the structure that postdate that time and um, that time the time which I'd mentioned previously the period of significance anti scrape would be advocating for leaving all those additions on showcasing the life of the structure as how it progressed over time in totality and this is uh, probably oversimplification of that, but we're just, we're gonna keep rolling. Um, most of the museums are attempting to showcase a specific period of time. So the idea that anything that was more modern might distract from that historic interpretation of the site. But the problem is that there isn't as much documentation as you might think for reconstructing historic buildings from nothing, or even restoring missing pieces. Uh, we might have photographs, we might have eyewitness accounts, maybe even architectural plans, but anytime we fill in the gaps, with something that's conjectural, we're presenting something that's uh, as truth that is not truth. We have a traditional craftsmen that are very good, but there might be regional variations to construction methods that are different now than they were in the past. Architectural plans don't necessarily reflect exactly how a structure was built. And even the availability of historic materials such as old growth lumber would mean differences in how a building is reconstructed today. Uh, so if someone looks at this and thinks, this is exactly how this was in the colonial times. Uh, instead of, oh, this is a representation of what this might have looked like, then we're skirting into dangerous territory. And you know, it's, I think you know, we've, if you own a house or move into a house ever, structures don't get handed down in pristine condition. And the reason is because they, they got lived in and life happened there. And that's what makes them interesting. And um, if they were vacant and empty of history, they wouldn't have survived into the present from the past because no one would have cared about them. Um, Frank Vagnoni, who wrote a very great book called um, The Anarchist Guide for Historic House Museums, highly recommend it. He's the executive director of Old Salem in Winston-Salem, North Carolina now. He mentions in his writing how surprising it was to see a demolished historic home because the demolition debris wasn't as large a pile as he had expected. And he, because you, know, you think, oh, houses had this big, you know, rich life, and then it's reduced down to this tiny pile of rubble. And it's because um, it's in those negative spaces, the rooms where life happens, that give the house historic value in most cases. Um, of course, when we're not talking about the, uh, if this from, from a famous architect or some defining work from a specific architect. But many restorations remove evidence of past life in favor of one period of significance. And sometimes the period of significance is very narrow. Sometimes it's limited to less than 5% of the life of a structure or a site. And certainly some of the museum villages that we're gonna look at, uh, sometimes the site has served longer as a museum than it had actually served in the period of significance it's being interpreted. Oops. Original conditions. It would be impossible and uh, this, is, this goes without saying, I should think, but it would be impossible to recreate the conditions uh, in a historic setting, in a historic muse museum village. And on the same coin, would we really want to recreate the original conditions? So what's missing? The streets aren't filled with open sewage. The interpreters don't have disfiguring marks, uh, scars from smallpox. But you do have clean restrooms. You have interpreters who probably have most of their teeth. You can drink from water fountains without having to worry about getting cholera. And the streets are tidy. The interpreter's clothes are clean and they're required to practice good personal hygiene. I mean, these are things, these are concessions that are made for our benefit. You know, these are things, uh, you know, certainly breaking that fourth wall again by not having, uh, you, when you look at photos of St. Augustine from the historic, and I recommend going to the historical society, visiting the library, uh, getting scans of photos and becoming a member of the Historical Society Library to go look at these, these images. There's so many cool photos of downtown St. Augustine, but one thing you'll notice before the streets were paved, that they were mud. And you know, think about how much rain have we had in the past couple weeks. Mud street, do you think that the amount of horse pee in the street is bad now from the horse <laughs> carriages that we have? No, you have no idea, and you're walking through the mud, and just the sides of the buildings going down the street are splashed with mud and feces and all sorts of stuff, and um, it's gross. And um, so we're not recreating that in the, in the museum villages, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, I'm just saying uh, 
we shouldn't be saying, this is exactly how it was, because it's not how it was. Representation. Not only are the sites literally too clean, but they are also metaphorically too clean. No surprises here. For many of these sites, um, the early sites, the interpretive focus is squarely on white men and um, at times women when the domestic crafts that were being traditionally performed were done by women and those were being showcased. In colonial times, I like to pick on Colonial Williamsburg because they're the big, they're the big guy and um, you don't want to pick on the little guy. But So Colonial Williamsburg, in actual colonial times in Williamsburg, about 40%, between 40 and 50% of the population was black, almost half. How many interpreters do you think were portraying non-white life in Williamsburg when they opened in the 1930s? Zero. They've gotten, they, in about the 1970s, so it took them a while, they did start introducing, uh, they, they remembered that slavery happened and um, they started including that into their interpretation. But, so they got there eventually. Um, but life and coexisting with other human beings is not clean and orderly. So when we go to museum villages and we see that life is being presented in a clean and orderly way, the alarm should start going off in our head because it's not realistic and it's not historic. So when you go to these sites, you ask yourself, how is slavery being dealt with here? How, any non-white identity being dealt with in this historic interpretation? Uh, how about indigenous people? Gender inequality? Poverty? Labor movements? Are these aspects being presented in the recreation, because they sure as hell existed historically. So you got to ask yourself why they're not being, if they're not, why they're not being, why they're being left out. Um, funding. For reconstructions, aside from the issues of conjecture, a big uh, issue with reconstruction as a preservation technique is that if you want to do it right, it's not cheap. I mean, if you do it wrong, it's not cheap. But um, the money that you're using to reconstruct something is seen as funding that's being taken away from preserving an existing historic structure. And there should be money for both, but there's not. Um, once a structure is built, then it needs to be kept up, which is also expensive. And if you open it to the public, then you are definitely needing to be doing maintenance on it and keeping that up. So that's another issue that we deal with. Uh, demolitions, we'll go back to the scrape, anti-scrape debate, but sometimes a pristine site was chosen for the reconstructed or recreated museum villages, but oftentimes it wasn't. This is particularly true in St. Augustine, and a lot of historic structures were demolished to make way for reconstructions so they could be built on original foundations. I think I have, oh, we'll get there eventually. Um, the best method would, you know, would be to do research and then determine what, if anything, should be reconstructed, but that wasn't always how we were able to do things. Sometimes we decided we want to reconstruct something, and then we did the research to, make, to see if that would uh, meet the, the property that was contiguous to the museum at the time. And that's not only St. Augustine, it's many places. But um, in, we'll pick on Colonial Williamsburg again. In Williamsburg, structures that postdated the period of significance in the area were demolished. So by 1955, Colonial Williamsburg had restored 82 buildings, they'd reconstructed 375 buildings, and they had demolished 616 buildings. And not to mention the reconstructions that disturbed the soil in historic areas uh, could mean the destruction of important archaeological material. Um, and again, I want to say this is not a condemnation of museum villages. These are meant to be considerations that you should go through, think about when you're at these sites, to assess the quality of the interpretation that's being presented. Um, certainly all of these issues, all of those issues, can be managed. And the limitations of the interpretive experience can be communicated to a visitor. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it does get tricky. And it's, it's part of my struggle with my, you know, loving museum villages, also loving the work that was done in St. Augustine historically in, in the work of the Preservation Board and how St. Augustine has developed. Because um, people do seem to think, you know, you think of it as like, well, it's either bad or it's good, or it's uh, authentic or it's not authentic, it's good, it's bad, you know. Uh, we, can only, we can only be as accurate as historic evidence will allow us to be. And as long, I think the important thing is communicating those limitations. And um, but there's still value to a, in a presentation of history with limitations. Um, and I do want to sort of kind of counterbalance that with a really good thing about museum villages is that they're interdisciplinary undertakings. 
you have a lot of people who are involved in making these things happen. You have architects, historians, archaeologists, landscape architects, preservationists, curators, historic craftsmen and women, interpreters, all have to come together to make these things work. Um, I'm going to dive into some history really quick. Now that we've established kind of like that basis for it, um, I'm going to talk about the World's Fairs. The first World's Fair, a world exhibition, was in London in 1851. It's called the Great Exhibition of Works of Industry of All Nations, or the Great Exposition. Maybe you've heard of the Crystal Palace, that's where it was. Um, but the big element that relates to our discussion is the introduction of national pavilions. These were build buildings that showcased the cultural and uh, culture and customs of other countries throughout the world and represented industrial and agricultural productions, also food, which was really important. The structures themselves were often an homage uh, to traditional architecture of the country. They gave a simulation of traveling around the world. And they made people want to travel in real life. But it established a concept of setting up buildings and then it was exhibiting in them uh, to showcase a national identity that was unique. The exhibits uh, were almost museums of national identity and social customs. Um, even it, in the Paris International Exposition of 1867, some of the people who were staffing these national uh, pavilions were in traditional, uh, traditional outfits. In the 1867 exposition, they had, there was the Austrian village. They set up a beer hall with people in costume. I'm sure very popular. At the Vienna Fair in 1873, the, for the first time, there was a Transylvanian village, and it was set up like an actual village. And I'm going to zip forward here a second. This is the Austrian village at the International Exposition of 1867. If I had told you this was a photo of the first museum village in, ever, you would probably believe me, because that's exact, kind of how they ended up looking, right? This was a little bit, the beer hall is uh, kind of right in the middle there, which, you know, of course. Um, this is the Transylvanian village at the International Exposition of 1873 in Vienna, set up, again, to kind of more, not accurate, but more of how a, a, a traditional village was set up. In, at the Philadelphia um, Centennial Exposition 1876, they had a trapper, um, a hunter's cabin set up, and they had all the tools in there that pioneers would use, and they had two real hunters in there demonstrating fishing and beaver hunting, and, the difference, of course, was that uh, they weren't showing you how things used to be done in the Old West. They were showing you how things were just done in the West at that point in time. Um, it wasn't the Old West yet. But that brings us to Skansen in Sweden. A Swede by the name of Arthur Hasselius had taken a trip to the Swedish province of Dalana. Um, Dalana, excuse me, if you've ever... Um, familiar with the Dalin, Dalin a horse. It's like a little red horse, a wooden horse that is very popular in Sweden. That's where they come from. 1872, he saw the effects of industrialization in that area and um, the threat that it posed to the traditional way of life and handicraft of the region. So he started collecting traditional uh, local clothing and he bought it from people who made it. And he, disp he displayed it at the Paris Exposition of 1878, but it just wasn't enough. He wanted... Uh, he didn't want to stop at just collecting the clothing and the tools and the farmers. He wanted the whole farm with the buildings and the people wearing the clothes and the animals. So in 1891, he opened the world's first permanent outdoor architectural museum. And people demonstrated crafts as well as traditional song and dance. And they, uh, there was reindeer. They had stocks set up. So in any museum you go to now and there's like, people taking selfies in the stocks and stuff like that, it's like, you blame Ar Arthur uh, Hasselius. He's the first guy who did it. He also set up the Nordic Museum in Stockholm. Um, this guy made a lot of waves. Um, this place is freaking huge. It's, and it was big when he started. It's been, it's, 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 he's, you know, some pe you know, sometimes you go start small and you work your way up. This guy started big. And, um, uh, but from here, it, it caught on like wildfire in Scandinavia and, and then slowly throughout Europe and eventually it made its way over to America. But, um, but that started 1891. The, it was not until 1908 that we have what we consider the per, first permanent outdoor museum in the United States. Uh, it's a stretch, but George Francis Dow, very um, a big time antiquarian, uh, 
did a lot of preservation work in Salem, Massachusetts, worked for the um, Essex Institute, which is now the Peabody Essex Museum. But um, he decided to save a house from 1684 from demolition. He moved it to the back of the Essex Institute. He furnished the house. So, so far, so good. We're, we're working. We're, we're on the right track. He dug a fake well. He created a fully equipped shoemaker's shop. He attached two separate porches from two separate uh, colonial era houses, and he stuck those in the back of the Essex uh, Institute as well. He took the cupola off of the roof of the Salem Merchant's House, and he stuck that in the ground in the middle. And then he uh, planted a historically appropriate garden, and he had it staffed with people in 17th century costume. So I wouldn't say this improves on the uh, concept of Skansen, but um, it's, actually, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not great. But you had to start somewhere. So as we kind of move into the, uh, as developing this more in, in America, you're going to recognize some names from big players at the beginning of the museum village movement. And some of these were multimillionaires, uh, Gilded Age tycoons, who were putting substantial sums of money towards preservation. So on one hand, we have guys making their fortunes off of industries that were responsible for the disappearing of historic communities and lifeways and crafts. Uh, but also creating museums and preserved spaces to save some of those things. So, you know, a little bit of um, a bit of a scale there. Uh, so industrial again, you know, so we had these guys. Industrialization is happening in America, and at the same time, to to you have all these factories going in. You need people to work in these factories. We had a lot of a large immigrant population moving into America at the time. At the you know that coincides with industrialization. They're moving here to work in factories, and there was a fear from families with long-time ties to America that saw these swarms of immigrants with different customs and what they saw as subversive ideologies, that these were people who were destroying the country. And man, I'm so glad nobody thinks or talks like that anymore. <laughs> but uh, as around this time, the idea of an American identity began to be established. And like that it wasn't these not just regional identities, but an American identity that had to be defended from, uh, from these um, people who were different. Um, this is a little bit of a battle as well between the merchant and agricultural classes, the traditional um, merchant and agricultural classes in America against these new industrial um, magnates and tycoons and so have you. The, uh, the colonial American houses, as a result, became kind of a cultural emblem for America, um, for the older American classes, as opposed to the Gilded Age barons, the new money people, who are importing and simulating styles from Europe, like this. Um, so creating historic sites to communicate this American identity and this history also served a second purpose, to Americanize and immigrant children and familiarize them with American history and ideals and the pantheon of white guys that we're supposed to know to help inspire them and assimilate into American culture. And I know this sounds like propaganda, in 1906, uh, William Randolph Hearst, who was the newspaper publisher for Hearst Communications, um, well, now it became Hearst Communications, excuse me, he was, the news, he was a uh, big time newspaper publisher. He purchased, um, he purchased New Salem, Illinois as a park. It was dedicated to the early life of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, it wasn't until 1918 that the first five structures were reconstructed on the site. Um, 1918 also, the centennial year for Illinois, also the same year that John Lloyd Wright, who is Frank Lloyd Wright's son, began marketing Lincoln Logs. So, uh, 1933, they were actually constructing Lincoln, real Lincoln Log houses in New Salem, Illinois. Um, they began constructing the actual log houses, and in 1934, it was actually turned over to the Civilian Conservation Corps. Henry Ford, who you probably know as the car guy and also the guy who um, implemented, uh, popularized the idea of um, assembly lines in America, got a, started small and he, got, and he went a lot bigger. But he started in Sudbury, Massachusetts in 1923. He stayed the Waveside Inn from, uh, this is a hotel from 1702. He purchased it and thousands of surrounding acres and moved other historic structures to the site, including a grist mill, blacksmith shop, in a schoolhouse that was supposedly attended by Mary from the poem Mary Had a Little Lamb. And that is like the most bonkers, like 
than a so-and-so slept here thing I've ever heard. Like, like Humpty Dumpty sat on this wall. It's like, uh, all right, dude. But the Wayside Inn actually was, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, that he, he really did start the first recreated village in America. Um, and then went from on from there, you may know uh, his larger project, Greenfield Village. Um, it's not Sudbury, Massachusetts. I did not finish typing where that was. Um, it was, De it's, yeah, Dearborn, Michigan. Um, whoops. Uh, in 1929, Greenfield Village opened. This was a recreated village as well. Eventually, it would include 85 structures, including all of Menlo Park, which is where um, Thomas Edison's uh, space where he was, uh, his workshop and stuff. It opened in, eight, in 1929 with a reenactment of Edison's discovery of the electric light bulb. The master of ceremonies for this opening was a guy named President Herbert Hoover. It was attended by Charles M. Schwab, uh, Gerard Swope, Otto H. Kahn, Hen uh, Henry Morgenthau, and John D. Rockefeller, Jr. So sometimes, you know, I, if you hear people talk about St. Augustine as the colon uh, Spanish colonial, colonial Williamsburg, and you can really think of Greenfield Village as the American Skansen. This was the first recreated village in America. Uh, it celebrated common people and their craft skills, as well as cooking and folk music and dancing. It was a counterpoint to mass production, which is very ironic, coming from Henry Ford. But, and it really, uh, really celebrated hard work, self-reliance, bootstraps being pulled up, uh, and a touch of suburbia in the layout. It's what um, author Mike Wallace refers to as a static utopia. And then kind of imagine that you're hearing dueling banjos playing, because right after this, uh, Colonial Williamsburg gets started, and this is, you know, obviously we all familiar with Colonial Williamsburg, started by John D. Rockefeller Jr. and Reverend, Gordon, Reverend William A.R. Gordon. Goodwin, golly, that guy. Um, in Williamsburg, Virginia. Um, this is a, rest again, I, you heard those numbers, I said, it's considered a restored village even though they reconstructed many more than they restored, but there's the fact that he took this entire town and he recreated, he brought it back to the, the colonial uh, time period, very much about colonial hero, hero worship of the time of the revolution. He started this work in 1926. He finished in the mid-1930s. Um, again, restored 82 buildings, reconstructed 375, and demolished 616. So um, other large preservation initiatives had saved individual houses, but this was an entire town. Colonial Williamsburg um, kind of initiated this idea of regarding an entire town as a preservation entity. So uh, this was something that was later formalized by the National Register having a historic district designation started here. So um, time, time goes on, uh, 1933, the New Deal decided they, they created the Historic American Building Survey. They wanted people to go out and survey buildings. Uh, no caveats now, we just wanna get all of this survey of. Uh, American historic architecture that's standing right now. When it was all said and done, they had 6,389 structures. They had measured drawings, photographs, they, all these were done. By 1966, half of those buildings had been demolished. In the 1950s and 60s, the interstate highway system, along with the boom of housings, so we had the baby boomers being born, invention of air conditioning made a lot of places livable. Uh, a push for urban renewal threatened many historic sites. Again, an outside threat catalyzed the creation of more museum villages, and there was a broadening in the landscape of identities that were being showcased. Some of the sites were now focusing on immigrant communities. There were also a lot of religious uh, groups that were being focused on, Shakers, Harmonist, Moravians, Amish. Um, uh, and I will say, in my investigation of these sites, that. They weren't, they weren't interpreting a specific time period. A common date that seemed to be used was a right around 1830. And on one hand, this is a really active time for pioneer settling and uh, you know, moving west and all that stuff. But it was also a pretty convenient time because it was post-revolution, pre-Civil War. Slavery had been abolished in the north, but not in the south. Um, but it was a really, um, that seems to be a very common time period that'd be represented in um, these museum villages. So slowly, representation of diverse communities began to be introduced uh, after the 60s. Um, like I mentioned, 1970s, um, slavery starts being interpreted at Colonial Williamsburg. Um, 
some photos of Williamsburg. This is just kind of like a time. I just wanted. To, I'm gonna. We're gonna zip through super quick. Some. Is anybody keeping track of time? I, I was supposed to keep a timer. And I didn't. Um, I think we're doing okay, and we're gonna. We're gonna be zipping. Um, I guess I, there was the intro in the beginning, so um, have a little bit of time before we make it to the 45-minute mark. But keep in mind, this is kind of things that were happening uh, simultaneously with, with, with the creation of these sort of things. Um, Mission 66, civil rights movement, uh, Cuban Revolution, Civil War, Vietnam War, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we're going to kind of just be blowing through stuff. I, I kind of... I. I kind of standardized this in a little bit to show kind of the time period that's being interpreted, where it's located, the year it was established, and whether, if is it a restored village, is it a recreated village, or is it a reconstructed village? At Mystic Seaport, Spring Mill Village, very nice, Old Economy Village, and you also notice that these are not just in one state, we're spreading out across the country. And this is a sampling, this is not everything. I, I have 98 structures that I've I've been going, th or 98 sites that I've gone through, and I'm add adding and adding and adding and adding and adding every day. Um, Cooperstown, New York, Old Sturbridge Village in Massachusetts, Old Salem in North Carolina, really, really, really cool. Old Deerfield, Massachusetts. Plymouth Plantation, um, very, very cool place. Uh, and instead of, this is a very specific time period that's being interpreted at Plymouth Plantation. Hancock Shaker Village. And then, aha, St. Augustine Antiguo. The Historic St. Augustine Preservation, or the Historical Restoration and Preservation Commission was established in 1959, but the program was inaugurated in 1963, so I gave that as the start date. And I just wanna talk really quickly um, about the sort of things that, uh, the reverberations that this museum village had on the community. And I'll try to do it as quick as possible, because I do, we, I do have to, I have like a, it does wrap up, I promise. But um, this is St. George Street. The, the photo on the bottom, can we walk with this? I guess we can walk with this. This photo on the bottom, um, if some people may know, but this, uh, for those of you, especially for Flagler students, this right here is where the Flagler Legacy Store is. So Kuna Street comes right here, and you're looking, obviously, uh, south towards the plaza. You can see the cathedral there. So. St. George Street was the big, this was the downtown streets is where you went and did your shopping. This was downtown. Um, but things started to change when the museum village started, you know, as we obviously know today, it doesn't look like this. So by having the museum village there, having the, the Historic St. Augustine Preservation Board that was kind of spearheading this, and there was obviously partnerships between um, the Historical Society and other sort of groups, uh, local groups that were, were, were um, kind of supporting this idea of having a restored area of the town. But it still affects us today because that this is the time period when they said like, okay, we're gonna start having design guidelines, architectural standards for new construction, existing construction, how many neon signs are on St. George Street? <laughs> Too bad, I think they're actually pretty cool. But um, there's some of them are being, uh, are being landmarked and part of the National Register, uh, historic signage now, uh, we missed out. But anyway, but so um, this is the Oliveros House in 1965, it was reconstructed. Uh, this is where, the Oliveros House is where the Flagler Legacy is, so we're here, we're on the corner, Kuna, St. George Street, they did archaeological research, like I mentioned. Um, they found the original foundations. So when you walk, this is a Google Street View image of the building as it is today. When you walk in the door and you walk to the different rooms, you're walking into the rooms that, as they, the fenestration of the building rep is reflective of what it was historically. Um, now, obviously, the height of the building, the pitch of the roof, uh, the w placement of the windows, stuff like that is... Um, a conjecture based off of research and photos that was done. Um, with windows, not so much we can tell from photos, but the interior layout beyond that uh, is a little bit shakier. But the idea that we don't have driving on St. George Street anymore. These sidewalks were abandoned by the city and given to the, given to the state as part of, when they built those buildings, they built them right up on the street. 
So, um, again, like the, uh, St. George Street being a walking street now is the result of that, have the, having a museum village there, not driving on St. George Street. The balcony sticking out, that was another thing. I mean, only, not only was it a life safety issue, you don't want to have a bunch of cars driving down the street with your main tourist thoroughfare. It was also, there's a milk truck that hit the balcony of the Worth House, or the, no, Sanchez House, which is right there on the corner of Treasury, or near the corner of Treasury and St. George. Um, Direct down from the, um, right down there. Anyway, here's another before and after photo. Obviously, um, a lot different uh, transforming St. Augustine going along with the, the idea. This is a photo from the National Geographic. Um, definitely what it looked like historically. Um, but the thing that we, I wanted to kind of, uh, so, I've left this out until this point. Um, one of the critiques that you see a lot from museum villages is that there's this creeping specter of what's called edutainment, and that you're sacrificing a historical accuracy for the sake of entertainment. And um, it was always kind of pres present, but it kind of started tipping towards a little bit more. Um, you know, you always hear people say like, well, this is real history, this isn't Disney World. And or on the other side, people think, oh, that was reconstructed? That's fake, that's Disney stuff. So I really do want to talk about actual Disney World because on one hand, this is, you know, um, when he, this, Disneyland opened in 1955. Disney World didn't open until 1971, but where did Margot go? I'm pointing to where she was. Ha! Hey, we talked on the phone the other day about this and I, Margot said something that I loved and she was talking about how after Disney World came to Florida in 1971, St. Augustine went from becoming a destination to becoming a day trip. And I thought that was so well put. I loved it. Um, but, so really, you think about how, I mean, not only did the rest of the Museum Village Historic St. Augustine Preservation Board, etc., uh, efforts of the Historical Society, other uh, private and state groups have that big impact on the city, but in comes Walt Disney. Um, Disney had already dipped his toes into history with the Hall of Presidents. Um, and there were other history themed theme parks that were popping up. Um, have you guys ever heard of Freedom Land in the Bronx? Holy crap, this place was wild. It was only open for four years. The whole layout was like America. You know, we're talking about like this. This is really when it, you really start dipping into edutainment. This is taking out his, You're just using history as a skeleton, and you're building roller coasters through that skeleton. And um, I mean, it was wild. There was an, there was a there was a, a ride or an experience where you p helped to put out the Chicago fire, and that's what that was in the, on the bottom right hand side, and that's engaging kids in history. I love it. There was, a, there was a fire in St. Augustine, and uh, you know, there's been several fires. I think we could maybe make, you know, this would be a fun interactive experience that we could try. Um, anyway, uh, in 1982, Disney opened up Epcot, which many people, uh, well, a lot of time when you think about it, you think of the World Showcase, which is where the countries are, but it actually had two zones, Future World and the World Showcase. So um, ironically, they spent a lot of time talking about history in Future World. But um, these exhibits, spaces were sponsored by different corporations, but here's the interesting thing. Future World was divided into nine spaces. They were sponsored by major corporations. What were these spaces called? Pavilions. Much like the World's Fairs uh, that we talked about at the beginning, this is really, you can think of Epcot as like the first permanent um, World's Fair. Spaceship Earth was sponsored by AT&T. Communicore was sponsored by AT&T. The Universe of Energy was sponsored by Exxon. Uh, World of Motion was sponsored by General Motors. The Land was sponsored by Kraft. Imagination was sponsored by Kodak. The Living Seas was sponsored by United Technologies. World Wonders of Life was sponsored by the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. And Horizons was sponsored by General Electric. So similarly to when we talk about how, what kind of history are we getting about the, the good old days of life from the guy who invented mass production, 
uh, are we really getting a very broad and uh, unbiased understanding of energy if we're hearing about it from Exxon? Probably not. But um, this was really kind of the first thing, and I wanted to end with this idea, dipping into the, um, just going into the far, the far, far end of edutainment. Um, this is a theme park. Uh, just coming, again, just to bring it back up to where we started, we've seen this loop background at the beginning, but the Disney Corporation wanted to really drive this home, and they veered wildly towards entertainment and away from education. They started this, they wanted to start Disney's America. This was an idea only, they never, this never happened. I'm not sure if you've heard about it, but this is a theme park that Disney planned to build in a 3,000 acre tract of land. The park was only going to uh, occupy about 100 acres. But um, in Haymarket, Virginia, which is five miles away from Manassas National Battlefield Park. Uh, it was opposed by many people. Many because they thought this was, um, a lot of people thought that the, because the brand, people had brand loyalty to Disney because they thought it would be so popular that it would siphon tourists away and money away from the actual historical, uh, historical sites. Also, a lot of the cars being there, the pollution. Um, locally, it was actually a pretty popular idea because of the jobs that it was gonna bring, but uh, people really rallied. They were, were protests on the National Mall. The park was going to include, the renderings for this, by the way, are awesome. And you should check, I mean, this is just wild stuff. This was gonna be, um, this was the vision for what was gonna happen. Um, here's a, an area that you can see a, a Real, uh, roller coaster. Um, the park was going to include an Indian village, a Lewis and, Clark, Lewis and Clark raft ride, a Civil War fort with reenactments, an Ellis Island replica, a factory town with a roller coaster ride that went through a steer, steel mill, a World War II aircraft with flight simulations, a state fair with a Ferris wheel, a family farm with a country wedding and a barn dance, all sorts of good stuff. But um, perhaps ironically, it was Disney's promise to unsanitize history that doomed the project. And they were interested in shedding propaganda and highlighting more of an emotional and controversial aspects of American history. But the question a lot of people had, obviously, was, is Disney, the Disney Corporation the best arbiter of that history? This is a quote um, It was made by Bob Weiss senior vice president of Walt Disney Engineering. Uh, he said in a press conference to other human beings, we wanna make you a Civil War soldier. We wanna make you feel what it was like to be a slave or what it was like to escape through the Underground Railroad. Holy crap. Like, obviously this didn't happen after this and obviously uh, he was banned from speaking to the public after that press conference. Um, so anyway, I, yeah. So, I wanted to end with this little quote here uh, from Henry Glassy, but we kind of saw this arc that this had taken, and obviously not every museum village did this, but I think that this idea that in popular culture that we had these museum villages and this history, and then this history became less of a, an opportunity to learn about the, some aspect of the past and more as a vehicle for escapism as a vehicle for, uh, you know, a rich vein for entertainment. And um, as we veered away from, and as we veered tor more towards entertainment, I think that um, it got really dangerous. And I think that it can still be dangerous in, in historic sites that do that. Uh, I think it's, I think that these types of sites, museum villages, that is, uh, they're valuable tools as long as the limitations of the experience are being communicated with the guests. And again, this quote, um, if you cannot enter passionately into the life of your own times, you cannot enter compassionately into the life of the past. The past is used to escape the present. The past will escape you. Um, so anyway, I think that is the end of my talk. Thank you. Uh, it's this, I hope that you kind of will think of this as an introductory kind of like uh, discussion on this topic. I'm doing, planning on doing a lot more research on it. And um, hopefully, and this is, I know this is a very niche topic, not everyone's into it, but I plan on making, I'm gonna have this big database of these types of sites and make it available um, to whoever wants it. <laughs>
Uh, so we're going to try to um, at least have a way to kind of look at this aspect of museum history, preservation history. And um, I thought I was going to put this together and start filtering the data and be able to like make these, oh, oh, now I can see that everything made in between this period. I have, it doesn't make any sense to me yet, but eventually I think it will. So I, we'll get there. I want you to tell them the story about your relationship oh, with this. Oh, I was really excited to get to talk in this room um, because this is where we did choir class when I was at Flagler. Um, so we came in here every Tuesday, Thursday, and we gathered around the piano and we sang songs, and it was really great. And Dr. Graham, uh, where is he? he? He's the one who told me to, uh, he suggested to join choir. Um, I think he told me it was a good way to meet ladies. So I, think, uh, but, so I, I did a join choir, and, and that's my connection to Flag Room. But guys, thank you so much for listening and bearing with me as I talked about this uh, history. And um, I don't know if it made sense, but um, I'm sure glad you sat through it. Thanks, guys. Thank